that was in a position that I could just quit my job and do this full time. And thank God, you know, for Jeff Irvine because he 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 paid for the food and the and the, and the roof over my head for a long time while I was working uh, on the on this and the and the um, you know and the saving of the stuff at the auction. Um, and so I just feel like you know those folks in Virginia, you know, they did a lot of good work. Yeah. I think they'll be happy to hear that. Yeah. I'll make that like a refrain yeah. <laughs> as I go forward. By the way, Barbara Irvine told me to tell you. You know the Alice Paul Institute? You made that happen. <laughs> you don't know it, but you did. Yeah, but you did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that'll be, that'll be a cheerful yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's always good because this history is complicated. Yeah. Um, yes, it is. Yeah. I mean, I don't think people... It, it, one of the things that was so interesting is when um, we bought the collection, some of the items that we gave to the Smithsonian ended up being part of a major exhibition there mm -hmm. called From Parlor to Politics that was done by Edie Mayo, who was the curator in the political history division uh, of the Smithsonian. And she talked about, um, you know, we, I got to know Edie very well over the years, and we've talked many times about the inner relationships among these women and the people who worked for suffrage and the people who worked for, um, you know, clean water and the people who worked. In other words, there was a lot of cross fertilization, mm -hmm. and that's something that I think today we aren't as aware of. I mean, we can read about some of this stuff in the history books, but we don't somehow. Um, there's not a lot of records kept of who were friends and who were colleagues and who did work together and all that sort of stuff across these different lines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So across issues. Yes, yeah, across, across issues. communities of different kinds. Yeah. Yeah. And that wasn't always, I mean, one of the things that's, um, you have to always keep in mind about that was that that process wasn't always smooth. Right. Oh, no, you know? no, it was not. Absolutely. <laughs> it wasn't um, always a positive story. And it didn't always work out. Right. But, you know, um, there were many there were many interesting lapses um, there that could have, could have gone another way. But um, we lose that because mm -hmm. we concentrate, Bobby and I were talking about this yesterday, that we concentrate so much on where the conflicts arise. Yeah. That we don't remember the people who were working across issues, yeah. across communities to just mm -hmm. keep stuff moving, mm -hmm. um, even though organizations may have split or broken in half or yes. stopped working with each other or you yes. know, whatever was going on. So right. Right. that holds everything together, but we forget about those, those people mm -hmm. way too easily. Yeah. We need that model these days. Oh, we do. More than ever, I think, because you know, so much of feminist work has become intersectional. Mm -hmm. um, and working to try to uh, find those points of integration and uh, common purpose and yes. alliance, real alliance, mm -hmm. um, across communities that vary tremendously and that don't trust each other much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, and there's, if we had those examples from, you know, in the historical record of people who were good at that, <laughs> mm -hmm. this might go a little bit more smoothly, what yes. people are trying to build today. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of, um, it's almost just it's just soul work people have to do mm -hmm. to be able to do this kind of um, commitment to each other. Yes, you know? right. And uh, we don't have good models. No, and that, that, that's and that's sad. I mean, there should be. I I would have thought, frankly, that somebody. I'm, I feel like somebody has either done a dissertation on this or. There's got to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they really need to publish it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's probably hiding in the, you know, the Michigan Index someplace, you know, the dissertation that will help us do this. Um, but yeah, it would, be, it would be good to have people who study, you know, sort of intersectionality as a thing that they do yes. Yes. to look for that history. Mm -hmm. um, because we need, to, we need to figure out how to glue ourselves together a little better, mm -hmm. you know, and, and in a more reasonable way. Yes, you know, I agree. Not to try to be each other's um, way of being or commit completely to everything in each other's projects, but to find really good ways to overlap and work together when mm. we can. You mm -hmm. know, um, I just have no idea how that's going to work out. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't 
know the answer to that. But. Yeah, nor I. But yeah. uh, you know, the, I, I know I know it can happen. Yeah, <laughs> it has, right? Um, which I guess kind of turns us to to now, almost, you know, to the present and mm -hmm. um, to uh, the future. You know, the ERA is still a live issue. Yes, it is. Um, many organizations of different stripes are still working um, yeah. for uh, its ratification, for the opportunity to continue working on its ratification. Um, and there's there are hosts of sort of new feminist issues that are, they're not new, but they're getting more attention. They're yes. more pertinent these mm -hmm. days. Um, and they're a little bit more social, I guess, than obviously political. Um, there's a great deal of talk, for instance, among uh, young feminists these days about the rape culture, mm -hmm. right? There's this weird, it feels like a very strange kind of backlash, you know, um, because it's diffuse. Yes. Um, and because it's random and because um, it's your friends, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I wonder what you, these things are kind of interrelated in my head, <laughs> but I wonder what you um, think about when you look at those issues, when you hear about when those things come across the internet for you or, yeah. or uh, across the news and, and the ERA both and sort of what young feminists are growing up into and, and needing to take on for themselves. Um, what has passed through your mind? What do you observe about those kinds of things? Well, I feel like young women today um, are in a much more dangerous and threatening world than I grew up in, or my experience. Uh, you know, I grew up in a small town in the South, and there was a lot that went on there. But um, you didn't, people weren't snatched off the street in the town I grew up in um, and raped or killed or whatever. I mean, it was just not that sort of a place. Um, and maybe it happened and we just didn't hear about it because it was, you know, no one was tweeting about it or emailing or Facebooking or whatever. Um, so maybe it's just a case of not knowing. But I, I lived, I think I grew up in a more protected environment than I think a lot of women grow up in today. Um, and so therefore, I think they have to be um, much more savvy and wary and aware, mm -hmm. and I'm of the opinion, I mean, this whole thing of, um, well, you know, she was walking down the street at three o'clock in the morning um, by herself, and, um, you know, she probably got what she deserved because anybody who knows what is what's going on. So I'm not, I'm not a believer in that. Mm -hmm. I'm not a believe in, believer in blaming the victim. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I think that women have to be much more vigilant about their personal safety and about the general attitude that prevails mm -hmm. about women. And I just, um, I don't know, I mean, I, I feel as though, maybe I'm, feel, maybe I'm a little too Pollyanna about it, but I, I feel as though I grew up in a, in a much simpler time. Mm -hmm that women were not as threatened with death, rape, whatever, as a backlash to whatever was going on, or that young men could just do whatever they wanted to do. Now, I know this all went on, mm -hmm. but it was not as open mm -hmm. as it is today. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that we know about it because once you know about it, you can do something about it. Mm -hmm. But the question is, unless you re-educate both young women and men about this, how do you accomplish that? I mean, it, it's a total reorientation mm -hmm. of their mindset about some, your place in the world. Some behaviors are off limits. Yeah. Right? Some right. things are not funny. Right. Um, you right. know, you were talking about the example of a woman on the street at three o'clock in the morning, but what we're really talking about are women who go to the bathroom at the frat party. Yeah, absolutely. You know? yeah, too. <laughs> I mean, yeah, right. Women absolutely. who really do think they're in situations where they're, they're with people they know and they think they trust and um, and and 
it turns out that they can't. Right. You know? no, no. Um, right. I agree. And, and I was thinking about when more. I said it because it's not just, you know, the person out there by herself, but yes, fraternity party. Yeah. And I do know that the that the um, statistics today about um, women on college campuses it is it, it's very disturbing. It's bodily. And I'll be honest, if I were the parent of well, I mean I was going to say it, a young woman, but I would be concerned if I was a, if I was the parent of a, of a son uh, that age going to school and what they were exposed to, mm -hmm. and it really is frightening, mm -hmm. frightening. Yeah. And I can understand why parents, you know, they talk about the helicopter parents and overly protective and all of that sort of stuff, but I can understand why people are as concerned as they are about what's going to happen to my daughter or my son or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it just is. I think I, I go back and maybe it's because I went to graduate school at the University of Virginia that I think back to the, the thing in the, in the news several couple three years ago about the young woman who was um, who died as a result of a beating by her um, boyfriend mm -hmm. at, at UVA. Yeah. And he's now serving, I mean, he's in prison. Yeah. And I just, you know, I, I remember at the time thinking, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be the, the parents of that young woman and the parents of the young guy. You know, he had been drinking. I mean, the whole thing was just, mm -hmm. it's horrible. It's mm -hmm. horrible. And uh, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, I don't know how... Unless somebody is, and I, and I say this, unless women are pretty definitive about where they stand mm -hmm. on some of these things, um, I don't know how they can avoid being approached um, with, well, you know, why don't we just do this, or why don't we just do that, or whatever, or the fact that some women it's not a problem for them if you, I mean, you know, uh, being very sexually active. And so the expectation becomes that every girl that I'm with is going to be willing to do this. Which and and how do you say to, no? Which goes back to women not actually, I mean, it gets to kind of a root issue. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, yeah. still hasn't solved, no. which is that women still aren't individuals. Right. right? If a woman behaves right. this way, this is how women are. Right. If a woman behaves Absolutely. This, this is how women are. As opposed to you know encountering you know, some women enjoy their sexuality more than others do. Right. You know, women walk around with different sets of values about how they're going to live their lives, and right. that a generalization can be placed that way is part of the is part of the danger. Um, so the whole there are everything that's going on. I think on college campuses, I know there's all kinds of. Um, well, it's getting a lot of attention now. Uh, educational. I mean, there's all sorts of programming about mm -hmm. um, attitudes towards women and men, you know, young women and young men, and this and that, and so on. And I all of the, I, it's great. I'm glad mm -hmm. glad somebody's doing it. Mm -hmm. They have to do it, well, you know, or they're going to be sued within an inch of their life. marches for a thousand years, yeah. but but um, yeah, I think one of the things that's that's starting to maybe um, get a get some traction in, is the idea that. It, Universities need to take the situation more seriously. Oh yes, um, and I was that the difficulty, you know, that the, the orientation you need to give. There's this, you know, this is one of the sort of popular strong arguments is that the orientation you need to give before freshman year starts is not to tell girls to carry their keys and walk in pairs, and although they should, yeah, um, but just to tell boys. You know, which of these behaviors don't happen here? Mm. <laughs> you yeah. know, because that conversation has often been absent. You know, these are the limitations on your behavior, young man. Right. Right. You know, um, and where you can be, and when you can be there, and why. Um, and that's, I think, we're beginning to come to a much better consciousness about that. I know there are some parents who are friends of mine my age who um, are going to definitely be looking at, you know, their university's policies regarding, you know, what does the university do when a football player is accused of rape? Absolutely. You know, what automatically happens and how do we handle this? And if it's not up to their standard, they're not going to let their daughter go to that school, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think when that becomes a very pop a really regular thing for parents to do, 
it will really make a difference for universities. You know, well, and think about, I mean, you know, as you were talking, that made me think about, um, uh, I, through all my years in undergraduate and graduate school, I was, I never was in fear for my safety. Mm -hmm. um, and think about being afraid of what might happen to you if you walk down the street, go to a parking lot at night or whatever. Uh, and how, how, yeah, going to the library. <laughs> how that impacts your sense of yourself and your level of self-confidence to know that you can't um, be, can't walk around freely or do be wherever you are freely without fear of some something happening to you. How that diminishes you as a person, and how it diminishes. Even how you see yourself in your future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and your, your relationships. I mean, I'm really wondering about that among young women and young men today. You know, just what level of what happens to trust and what happens to intimacy yes. in a culture where you have these kinds of problems and video right. yes. <laughs> and streaming and yes. you know people who don't stop a situation um, and how you know it seems to me that that's going to create a real um, gap a real coldness mm -hmm. that's going to be very difficult for young people to negotiate over the course of their lives you mm -hmm. know just knowing you know you spend four or five, ten years of your life <laughs> yeah. constantly on the defense. You know, you're not going to drop your guard very easily yes. around people. So I'm worried about that just in, as a general thing, mm -hmm. um, a general psychological sort of shift. Because we didn't have it. I ran with a crew of young mm -hmm. men and women all the way through college. I mean, constant it just there was absolutely no sense of that no fear among that group of people and we were a bunch of unwashed punk rockers i mean we didn't look respectable you know <laughs> <laughs> we did not look like the kids who were behaving well you know but we were really nice to yeah. each other most of the time <laughs> so. um, really i mean it was like a conscious yeah. thing um so i just i, I remember that that friendship, you mm -hmm. know, and just knowing that I had this, like, gang of folks mm -hmm. that I could be anywhere with, and it was okay. Yeah. You know? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I kind of miss that, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were amazing people. But, um, yeah, what was my other question? It was future-oriented. Oh, yes, the ERA. Mm. Um, and it might be a good place to, I don't know how you feel, uh, what other subjects you want to cover. Um, okay. Because we can really do this for another little while, if you like. You, it's, know, I, you know, you need to get on the road, my dear. I'm the one who has to Spe talk. Speaking of safety. Yes. <laughs> but it is spring now. Yes, it's it is. Light. It is. Light You're right. For a very long time. But I, I don't have a whole lot more than I need to say or, you know, feel like I okay. should say. Okay. Well, then I'm not... But I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel like... Um, was there something else you wanted to ask me about the ERA? Um, there are a number of present strategies for working on its continued ratification process um, and keeping it alive and making that a successful change for women mm -hmm. so that we are legal people yes, <laughs> in, yes. in the full full sense of, of that word. Um, and just how where you are with that process for yourself, how you think about... Um, what various organizations are doing uh, as efforts to support ratifying the ERA and just the landscape because there's a lot of different directions people are running. Yes. Um, and it's, you know, I'm not asking to, to start a you know, huge debate, um, but it already is one, so. <laughs> well, I'm, I am um, completely in support of right now the two major strategies and there may be others but the two major strategies is the <clears throat> excuse me what, what i this is my lingo the do-over bill mm -hmm. which is basically reintroduce the era uh, get it through congress and have it go back out that so that's the thing that, that's the, the bill that carolyn maloney from mm -hmm. uh, congresswoman from new york is the prime sponsor on that in the house um and i think senator menendez uh, 
is the prime sponsor in the um, Senate on that. And then there's the three-state strategy bill, mm -hmm. uh, which has been around for a number of years.